Hello, and welcome to Writing with Ralph. I've got my writing shirt on, reminding us that writing is good for you. I, I think it's good for me. It helps me to keep sane in these crazy times. And um, I'm happy to be talking to you today. Um, this is uh, session number six, and we're going to be talking about um, poetry. So, uh, again, I hope that you have something to write on, you know, um, I'm going to say a few things that you might even want to write down if you're the kind of person who likes to take notes. You don't have to take notes, but I think that sometimes it's valuable to do that. Um, so we're going to be reading actually lots of poems today um, and hopefully pausing and thinking about them. And uh, it's my hope that these poems will get things triggered in your mind and get you thinking about something that you could write yourself. So I'm going to start with um, a poem from my book, um, a Writing Kind of Day. This is a poem called um, Snow Angel. I know that's something that not everybody around the country does. If you're in a warm place, you don't see a lot of snow. But one of the things that I loved as a kid was when you have really fresh snow, you can lie back and you can create a snow angel. And I started thinking about, I wonder what happens to, to that snow angel when you walk away. So this is not a rhyming poem. It's interesting, too, how the illustrator... Um, made the picture. You know, uh, when you write poems, you want to leave an image in the reader's head. So I think that in a really good book of poetry, the illustrations suggest an image without really dominating the read reader's brain. You know, you, you want to sort of leave room for the reader to still make an image. Anyway, Snow Angel. It's easy to make one, lying on your back and you, on the newest snow. You sweep your arms up and down to make a pattern that looks like wings. Later, you forget your creation, go inside for hot chocolate. That's when she rises from the snow, takes a feathery breath, tries out her wings. She skims over frozen lakes like the faintest handwriting. Later, when you climb beneath the covers, she peers in through your frosty window. Happy, you called her into the world. I'll read the last stanza. Later, when you climb beneath the covers, she peers in through your frosty window. Happy you called her into the world. And I'm not going to tell you what any poem means, but one of the things I kind of like about that poem, if I may say so, is that it's about a snow angel, what happens to it after you create it. But in some ways, it could also be about a poem itself. What happens to that poem after you create it? It kind of takes on a life all of its own. All right. And the second poem I'm going to share with you, just to kind of get our juices flowing, is a poem that I wrote. A friend, some friends and I rented a house up in um, New York one time in the middle of the winter, and I found a chunk of ice about this big that was on the porch outside. And what was interesting, when I looked at it closely, the chunk of ice was, was cracked a little bit. There was a prism inside there, like a little rainbow. So I realized as long as I kept that rain, that the ice cold, that rainbow would be preserved. So I wrote a poem called Rainbow and Ice. And this is a rhyming poem. I found a little rainbow trapped in a chunk of ice. Ice rainbows are seldom seen. I don't expect to find one twice. It stayed outside my window where the wind would keep it cold. There were seven strands of color in a tiny pot of gold. All winter long, I studied it, how the yellow rubbed the green. Red and indigo made bookends while the blue nestled in between. I wondered where it came from, this orphan rainbow child, and though I longed to tame it, I knew to keep it wild. One warm March day, the rainbow left, on brilliant wings it flew. Perhaps I'll see it, fully grown, when summer storms pass through. Okay, so um, we have been talking about the writer's notebook, and uh, that's been kind of one of the things that we keep coming back to. And um, I just want to say that there's a lot of things you can do in your notebook, you know, collecting funny moments or, or whatever. But one of the things that um, I like to do in my notebook also is to write down and, and write entries about what I wonder about. I call these fierce wonderings. And these are things that, you know, there's no easy answer to. These are things that you think about a, long, a lot. Um, one of my... Um, cousins once said to me, she said, I wonder why I'm, I'm attracted to all these selfish, narcissistic guys. And, and that's, that's a question that she's just thinking about a lot. And we all have things that we wonder about, we think about. And the notebook's a great place to, to write those things down. 
and just to let you let your mind go and let you let you, you know let yourself explore them. Um, I read some stories about some. Um, this is a sad thing, you know, a parent who who kind of abandoned the family, and it kept me thinking about what kind of parent would do that and why they might do it. And so I wrote a lot in my writer's notebook about that, and I ended up writing my. That became the seed for my book, um, Uncle Daddy, about a kid whose name is Rivers, and when he's like at about three years old, the dad goes out to get a pizza and just never comes back. And I started to think about why would somebody do that, and also how would that affect the family, the mom, the uh, the child that was left behind. And um, so um, I think Fierce Wonderings, I just want to bring that up and really encourage you to, to write about things that you... Um, you know, that you're not sure about, and you're, you're, you wonder a lot about. All right, so today we're going to be talking about writing poetry, um, and hopefully you'll get some ideas to write some of your own poems. Um, some kids love poetry, some kids don't, and some kids have hardly ever tried it. And it occurs to me that April is National Poetry Month in the United States. Of course, I always feel like poetry shouldn't just be shoehorned into one month. It should be something that goes through the whole year. Um, I know that I write poetry all the time. But um, I will say that I didn't really like poetry writing much in school because uh, when I was in school, it was really emphasized certain kinds of forms and rhyme that you had to do. Um, but when I got out of school, I developed a kind of writing about my own poetry, writing poetry that I could enjoy and, and uh, take some pleasure in. And some things I really love about poetry is that poetry is really short. It can be really quite short. A poem doesn't have to be very long. In fact, um, this is an anthology by um, my friend who has passed away, Paul Ginesco, a wonderful anthologist. And um, let me just show you the first two poems in this collection. The first poem is called, look at how short they are. The first poem is called Thumb, The Odd Friendless Boy Raised by Four Aunts. And then this one's even shorter, bruises, paint samples. Um, <laughs> and I mean, maybe a poem doesn't have to be that short, but it's amazing how you can say a lot in a short piece of, of writing. Um, and um, so poems can be short and, you know, some of the best poems I've read have been written by kids and they're very short. I know a boy named Matthew that wrote a poem called um, My Mom. And look at how short this is, and just look at what he does in this poetry, in, the, in this poem that he makes. My mom. My mom takes good care of me. She's the gardener. I'm the rose. She waters me every day. When it gets cold, she puts me in a pot and brings me inside. My mom takes good care of me. She's the gardener. I'm the rose. She waters me every day. When it gets cold, she puts me in a pot and brings me inside. Wow. He says so much in that little poem. And um, just a few, few lines, but uh, he really creates an image. And there's a lot of emotion and feeling in that poem. Um, so poems are short. And what's nice about that is that you, you write a poem. And if it works, great. And if it doesn't work, you know what? That's okay, too. You can you can put it aside and start another one. So um, that's one thing. Um, secondly, poems can be off, are often playful, you know, um, you've heard of maybe, you've heard of poetic license, you can kind of do whatever you want in poems, and uh, like I've been saying before, I like to do a lot of wordplay in my, in my writings, so, um, in this book, uh, writing, um, Water Planet, I was playing around with the word skipping, like when you skip things, and so it's called Skipping Stones. Daddy skips breakfast. Elizabeth skips rope. I skip stones. George skipped fourth grade. Brian skipped out of school. I skip stones. Flat stones, sharp stones, skinny as potato chips, kicking up wrinkles on the glass smooth lake. And you can see what I did there is I put down, I actually had the, I tried to make the words themselves kind of skip um, like they were like little stones on, on a river uh, or, or in a pond. So um, poems can be playful, and um, but also poems can be very intense. You know, pound for pound, poems you know really carry a punch. And um, I'm going to read you a poem from my book, 
water plant another poem um you know some of you guys know that i had a tragedy in my family when i was growing up my my brother was killed in a car accident when he was 17 i was about 21 so i wrote a poem in this book called dig down deep this is kind of a sad a sad poem my brother's name was bobby dig down deep there's water everywhere bobby used to tell me it's under the mountains even under the deserts if you dig down deep enough i didn't answer him he was my little brother and I just let him talk. But I learned that he was right when Bobby died a few weeks after his 17th birthday. My mother cried that night and every night for a solid year. Even the old, dry faces sprouted stony tears. So, um, and when, you know, I will say that when my brother was in that car accident, I read a lot of poetry and I read a lot of poetry and it kind of was something that kind of soothed my, my soul during that time. All right. So, um, one of the questions that will come up is, um, well, you know, what, what makes poetry and how, how do you write it? Um, so I have written a book, um, for kids on how to write poetry and I, I really recommend this book because I kind of don't emphasize rhyme in this book, but I really emphasize the heart of poetry, what it is. And um, one of the things that I say in the book and I, is that a poem kind of is built on, on three pillars. Um, images, a poem has a strong image. Some poems have strong music and some poems have uh, strong emotion. And not, now not all poems have all three elements. But these are three things that really oftentimes um, underlie. They're the foundations of, of a poem. Image, music, and emotion. Um, so let's read a few poems and um, read a few more poems and just see what we notice here. Um, all right. I'm going to... I've been reading a lot of poems for younger, for younger kids, I feel like. And I thought maybe I'd read one that's a little bit older. This is a book of poems about love called Buried Alive. And um, this is called How Rivers Flood. Bad news and current events. You flirting with Judd Roth while Mr. Hunt drones on about natural disasters. Quote, when a river floods, it remembers its old path, the one it used to follow before dams and levees, unquote. He calls on me, I shrug. Who cares about rivers, you, these dark waters rising fast inside me? <clears throat> so that's um, Buried Alive. And um, I also wrote a poem, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, sometimes I'll take, I, I like to like take something that's ordinary and see if I can find like a new way to look at it. You know, that's what poets often do. So I was thinking about, you know, I, I really love birds. I've always been interested in birds, and I particularly now take a lot of pictures of birds. So I was thinking about um, the nest of birds. And right now here in New Hampshire, because the the leaves are just beginning to bud, just beginning to bud, so there's no leaves on the trees, and um, you can see the old bird's nest up in the trees. So I wrote a, uh, a poem for my book, uh, Relatively Speaking, called Bird's Nest. And you can see the um, Walter... Crewed up, made some, made a beautiful illustration there of the of the bird's nest. Um, <clears throat> so this is called bird's nest, and you'll see that I take it, in, I, I talk about it in an ordinary way, but then I have a little bit of a little twist on it. Bird's nest. This is not a rhyming poem. You see bird's nests like unpicked fruit in branches bare of any leaves. When I was small, Grandma cut my hair and tossed the clumps onto our lawn. Quote. Birds will use it to line their nests and keep the eggs warm. Unquote. An amazing thing, my ordinary hair woven into a bird's wild tapestry. And I love that idea that just, you know, the, the hair would go out there and the birds would take it. And somehow my, my own hair, when I had some hair... <laughs> Um, used to get worn, uh, woven into a, a bird's nest. And um, let's see what else I was going to share here. Um, yeah, so we talked about how poems often um, have a strong image 
and a strong emotion. Um, in my book, I, I use a lot of, um, I include a lot of poetry written by kids. And this one girl wrote this poem um, about divorce, which is a serious subject. But I'm just going to read you the beginning of it and just listen to what she says. I just think it's amazing. She says, divorce. Parents together, they love each other, then they split, like the wrong ends of a magnet put together. Wow, like the wrong ends of a magnet put together. And if you've ever held a magnet, you know that the two parts that want to go together will snap together. But if you turn it around and you put the parts that don't want to go together, even if you try to push, they just don't want to go together. And I feel like she gave us an image of what it happened, what happens when a you know, a, a couple splitting up that we really can, we can really relate to. Wow, that's, a, that's an amazing image. All right. Um, so I'm going to give you a couple of tips about writing poetry, things that I want you to think about. Um, first of all, keep your poems grounded in specifics. A lot of times people get too floaty or too vague in general, and a good poem is really grounded in particular things about the world, you know, details, the five senses. So again, writing small, leaning in, and letting those details, like the trembling hands in that poem that I shared um, about the bravest deed, when the mother got involved and tried to break up these, the, the, the other mom that was smacking her kid, um, tr try to really be specific. So keep your poem grounded in specifics. That's the first thing. Now you may be thinking, yeah, but Mr. Fletcher, what about rhyme? And what I'd say about rhyme is don't worry about it. Yeah, rhyme can be cool. Um, and sometimes it makes the poem stronger, but sometimes rhyme feels forced in a poem. You know what I mean? I had this one girl that was writing a poem called uh, about Valentine's Day, and she said, on Valentine's Day you get presents, and sometimes you get nescents. And I said, wait a second, wait a second. What's a nescent? What's a nescent? She said, well, that's just a silly word that I invented to rhyme with present. So sometimes instead of us using rhyme, rhyme uses us. So I'm not saying don't do it. Um, and you'll see some of my poems I've been sharing with you do rhyme, but I don't think that all poems have to rhyme. Um, the other thing is, you, you may be wondering about line breaks in poetry. And um, this is kind of a big subject, but I just thought I'd mention this. Um, I wrote a poem, um, kind of another love poem, which I'll read you right now. Last night, after you hung up, I wrote you a poem, hoping it might change your heart. This morning I tell myself, get serious, man. Someone once compared writing a poem to dropping rose petals down a deep well, waiting for the splash. That should be that should be dropping instead of dropping, instead of drop. So I revised that to dropping <laughs> rose petals down a deep well, waiting for the splash. So that sounds like a poem, maybe, but it doesn't look like a poem. So one of the things that you can do is read through your poem and look for places where your voice kind of pauses. And because in a sent in a, in a story, the unit of thought is is a sentence, but in a poem, the unit of thought is a line. What words appear on one line? So when I when I read that poem last night, I, f I hear a kind of a pause there. Last night. So what I what I did here, let me show you. And I typed this up just because my handwriting is, is pretty atrocious. See what I did? I put a slash mark there. Last night, double slash double slash. After you hung up. I heard another pause there. I wrote, I wrote you a poem, hoping it might change your heart. See what I mean? So I'm listening to those pauses. And then when I recopy the poem, just the word last night will be on the in the next line. And then just the word, just the words after you hung up. So when I recopy the poem, it'll look like this. Last night, after you hung up, I wrote you a poem, hoping it might change your heart. You see how that looks more like a poem? So don't worry if it doesn't come out looking like a poem at the beginning. You can always go back and change it. And that's one of the things I was going to say to you earlier is that poems don't always come out the way you want at the beginning. It's okay to go back and change lines, cross out lines that don't work. I do that all the time. Um, take out story words, you know, like we have once and then when, all those words that we use in stories, but they don't quite fit as well in a poem. So don't be afraid to, to cut lines out of a poem and words out of a poem. Um, 
you know, I want to just say something to the um, upper grade kids that are maybe watching and, high, and the middle school kids and, and the adults. I find that as, as, as we get older, we have more to say. And sometimes well, we can almost write the energy out of a poem. Um, in poetry, longer is not necessarily better. Sometimes less is better. Um, so um, I always say it like this, that a, a poem is a snapshot. It's not a video. A poem is a sprint. It's not a leisurely 5K run. So a poems are short and they're intense. And don't be afraid to keep it short. Um, so I'm going to end, if I may, with a poem from my book, A Writing Kind of Day. And this poem really, I think, suggests that you could write poetry about anything. Anything is valuable to write about, and anything's worth writing about if you care about it, if it matters to you. So this is, this is a poem written from a point of view of a kid. Let's say he's about fifth grade. Some of you guys may have heard this poem before, but it's about a, a poem about a, from, a, from a point of view of a kid who wants to write about something, but his teacher says, no, 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 pick something different, pick something else. But he really wants to write about one particular thing, and it's called Squished Squirrel Poem. And it does have one mildly disgusting part, but I think it's okay. Squish, squish squirrel poem, written from the point of view of a kid. I wanted to write about a squished squirrel I saw on the road near my house last week. You can't write a poem about a squished squirrel, my teacher said to me. I mean, you just can't do it. Pick a sunrise or an eagle or a dolphin, he suggested. Pick something noble to lift the human spirit. I tried. I really did. But I kept coming back to that squirrel. Did his wife send him out to fetch some food or something? There was blood and guts, but here's what really got me. He had pretty dark eyes and they glistened still. You can't write a poem about a squished squirrel, my teacher insisted, but I don't think that's true. So, um, I want to thank you for spending these uh, few minutes together thinking about writing, and I really want to encourage you guys to to get out some paper when this is over, when you turn off the, the screen and, and just write. And what I would do is I would like look through your notebook. Maybe you'll find an idea in there that you want to work on. Um, but look for an image that really kind of stays in your mind. Um, that could be the seed of a poem. You know, I'll, I'll just end with this quick story that my mother had dementia at the end of her life. She had lost her memory. And my mother used to always like um, peel an orange for breakfast. But I remember one time I came downstairs and I saw her in the kitchen and instead of peeling one orange, she had peeled all the oranges in the bowl and they were all sitting in front of her peeled with a big pile of, of um, peelings next to her. And she gave me this uncertain smile. Like she wasn't sure that she'd done the right thing. I get a little emotional when I think about this, but that could be a poem. And what I like about it is it's, it's grounded in something particular. It's specific. It's an image that I've thought about a lot and it's emotional. So good luck with your poetry writing. Um, remember, uh, my email address is Fletcher. I'm sorry. My email address is figpudding at gmail.com. And I'd love to see any poems that you write. G figpudding at gmail.com. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye, guys.